Today is May the 24th, 2018, and my name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today I am in Hominy, Oklahoma, which is in Osage County, to interview Sandra Drummond, and this is part of our Oklahoma Conservation Heritage, Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project. So thank you for letting me come today. Thank you. Let's begin with learning a little bit about you. Uh, when and where were you born? Welcome to the heart of Osage County. That's, that's the important thing here. I was born here in Hominy, Oklahoma, and uh, I lived here all my life, literally. Yeah, born in the old Hominy City Hospital, which is no longer, and um, I just, you know, went to school here all 12 years, graduated in Hominy High School in 1965, uh, went on to OSU for one semester in about two weeks and ended up running off and practically running off and marrying my high school sweetheart in uh, 66 and then moved back to Hominy and um, pretty well raised my children here and everything. Dick was in the ranching business. I'm married to uh, Jack Richard Dick Drummond and um, uh, been here ever since. Well, when you left to go to OSU, what was your what were you majoring in? Well, I started in home economics. Okay. And then when I left OSU in February of that year, um, I continued to take a few classes along, but after four children, you know, a few years later, I did not continue, but always kind of wanted to do that. So um, my four children were in school. And in um, the early 1980s, I decided to go back to school with much discussion with my husband uh, and just went to Tulsa, to Tulsa Junior College at that time. It's now Tulsa Community College. And started picking up business classes because I was doing the ranch books. And uh, a lot of the accounting procedures I didn't understand. Depreciation was just something I, I couldn't understand. So I took a economics class and then an accounting class. And after the first semester, I really liked it. So I continued to uh, go on and pursue. Um, and after a couple of years, I only took like six hours a semester and went two days a week. But there were some other ladies from here that were going, so I, we commuted together, which you know kind of helped. Um, and my classes I had to fit in with my children's schedules. So when I completed over there, I lacked one class of having an associate degree. But to go on to OSU, I didn't need finite math. So I transferred on to OSU and picked up my business calculus over there. They wouldn't let you take business calculus at T TCC without finite math first, which so I did not get an associate degree over there and then commuted over there for about two and a half years. And there was still several uh, ladies from here and we commuted a lot together when we could, but I ended up having to go then three days a week. So, and at that time, then I had two daughters at OSU and uh, two daughters still at home, one in high school and one in junior high. So I completed my business management degree in uh, December of 87, which was at the same time that my husband had an accident at the ranch and passed away. And um, so at that time is when I, and with the girl's decision with helping me, we decided to go ahead and hold on to the ranch as much as we could. We had to do a lot of land changes and selling of things and stuff at that time. So, but we kept the, the home ranch here in Hominy, but it's, it's actually seven and a half miles east out here uh, on the Cotton Gin Road. So we're, we're still running and operating that. It was in a trust for 20 years. And so now it's been divided out between my children and me. Wow. So we're, we're, we're still, I'm still operating that with some outside uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs leases and things. So running a cow-calf operation, but then also keeping stalkers to kind of be able to cash flow 
a little bit more than twice a year. So I don't farm. I'm a grass grower, a grass producer, basically, and uh, have uh, hopefully made a big difference uh, with the ranch and um, everything. So the, the girls, I have four daughters and they live in four different states. So, but nine grandchildren. So, you know, we, I get, I get out of town every now and then to go see the grandchildren. So that's, that's fun and good. Well, how many acres are you managing? Uh, a little over 5,000 with the girls land and uh, I have one full-time man all, all the time. Um, I contract my hay for cutting and stuff because I, all the tractors and things that I had back then, I just, um, it was a mechanical nightmare as far as I was concerned and I did have some wheat pasture but through conservation efforts with the USDA I was able to put it into Bermuda mm -hmm. and it, it makes more sense because I'm too far from the river and our rainfall isn't exactly great for wheat pasture and things so. Well was it hard being a female back in 87 when you had to start doing the ranch business? It was it was different for sure. I had never really worked the ranch. Uh, helped work cattle a few times but basically I was the at-home mom taking care of the children and everything with the home. Um, but I always could see my idea of how things should have been done would have been different than what Dick's, but he was raised with it. My family is, is still here in Hominy. My dad was the Ford dealer. My mom was an at-home mom. We were very active in the church. My dad, my family was very active in the community. And um, so I didn't really have an agricultural background, um, but then with Dick, and I would go out and help him when we would have really bad weather and freezing, you know, I would leave the kids at home with a babysitter and I would go out and help him to chop ice and haul hay. And we had uh, at one time had leased some land over um, on the Arkansas River where we would put calves in the winter time and then, you know, sell them in the spring and stuff for the gain. And, and I would go out there with him and we would hay the cattle and stuff. But it was hard. It was, it was difficult. But... Um, in 87 it was different. I had a lot to learn and uh, it was basically a lot of the land was still in family with his brothers so we had to uh, go ahead and legally get a lot of that type of stuff changed around and um, so yeah it was it was different. So let's back up a minute. What were your parents what was your maiden name? My maiden name was Fallon. I don't think I'm related to Mary Fallon okay. at that point. But um, my dad, uh, my mother both were raised in Hominy. My dad was actually orphaned at 12 years of age and his uncle went to St. Louis, Missouri and brought him here. He was behind in school. So, you know, but he did, he graduated, went into the Coast Guard during World War II, served about six years. Mm. And um, my mom uh, was raised in Hominy and her family had the funeral home, which my grandfather came here from Arkansas and his wife, my grandmother, came from Kansas and they worked at the old Pioneer store, which was the Hominy Trading Company. Mm. And inside the funeral, inside the uh, Pioneer store, that's what it was later called, it was clothing, retail, furniture. There was a funeral home, a grocery store, a hardware department, you know, and it was a full service type store. And then my grandparents married, and but the funeral home was in the upstairs at the funeral home, at the Pioneer store and uh, they didn't really want it. Some of the board members didn't want it there anymore. So my grandfather, I guess, made them an offer. They moved it out and, and then he, they were able to rent from Mrs. Addie Drummond, who would be my grandchildren's, um, trying to think, great-great-grandmother. 
rented two houses where they lived in one house and the funeral home was in the other one. And it's still at that location today. Um, so my, my uh, grandparents ran the funeral home. My grandfather was kind of in charge of the cemetery here and very involved in the, in the uh, community. My grandfather served during World War II on the, uh, um, the board for uh, enlisted people and all of that. I can't remember what that's okay. called. Yeah. The cemetery is named here after my grandfather. So kind of stuck here in harmony, but it's not always a, a bad thing. So your grandparents were Fallons? No, or? my grandparents were pals. Okay. Yeah, I didn't really have much of a relationship with the others were deceased. My my uh, father's mother was her last name was Brock, and uh, her brother George Brock is the one that went to St. Louis and got my dad and brought him and his mother, uh, George Brock's mother. Um, yeah, because his mother, my grandmother, Marcia Goldina Brock, had died in St. Louis. And so the grandmother and my dad was brought back to Hominy, and he, he's the one, George Brock's the one that actually had the Ford dealership. Okay. And then when my dad came back after World War II, Grant George was not in good health, so dad was going to help him until, it, until his health improved. Um, and he had a heart condition, it did not, and he passed away. So dad just continued to run the agency and ran it as George Brock Ford until Aunt Louise, who had also was George's wife that had raised him, she passed away in 57 and then my dad changed the dealership to Bill Fallon Ford. So um, we always grew up with new cars we never owned cars, you know. I find out now at reunions and stuff that everybody thought we were rich because we always drove new cars. I can see that. But when my dad passed away in 1975, my mother had to buy her first car. And so that was kind of a, it was, you know, funny at the time, you know, um, that that's just the, the way it was. That's, we always had new cars. Well, did you have siblings? I do. I have an older brother that's retired now uh, in, from the oil industry. He's been a petroleum engineer for years and years, lives in Denver. And then I have a sister. There's four of us in six years. I have a sister, 11 months younger, who is retired in Altamont Springs, Florida. She has two daughters. And then I have a, a younger brother that died uh, from a massive heart attack. Um, and he was actually at the Ford garage he had taken over after my dad had died in 75 and he continued to run it but he finally decided he wasn't a salesman he was he was more the mechanic so he went into the oil business and had a roustabout business and stuff at the time of his death and, and he had two children so it's it's you know interesting well, two sisters I mean two girls two boys me uh, oh, the three of you. Oh, yes, yes. No, two and two. Two, two. two boys and two girls. That's what yeah. I... Yeah, yeah. Steve, Sondra, Cheryl, and Scott. All S's. All S's. Yeah, yeah. Is there a story behind that? They you know, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I know. My dad's legal name was William Shirley Fallon. And in St. Louis, at the time that he was born, there was a boxer with the last name of Shirley. Well, my dad hated that name because he thought it was female. When my younger sister was born, my mother named her Shirley and put it on her birth certificate. But my grandmother, and my dad was not happy, but my grandmother, Jeanette Powell, was the Osage County Registrar for births. And, and uh, so he went to her and tore it up, and then he named her Cheryl. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know, those funny little family stories. My mother, my, my dad died in, after a car accident in 1975. My mother is 95 years old mm -hmm. and lives in Hominy, very independent. She still drives within a 10-mile radius. 
but is in relatively good health. So if she could just hear a little better, she'd be happier. But she's she's good. She's good. So I check in with her every day and you know, my family comes back and spends time with her, so that's good. Okay, and you said you went all school through here, or is it, was it all in one grade, um, one in building, grades 1 through 12, all in one building? No, you know, I don't remember kindergarten, but I guess it was in a church building mm -hmm. here, and then I went to Horseman Elementary School, and uh, last fall they actually finally tore the school down. Mm -hmm. It was way early in the 50s, and it needed to be, part of it had already been abandoned, you know, and, um, but... It was actually torn down. Everybody couldn't believe it was, and it is still. There are still newer buildings there. It's the Horseman Elementary. And then I went to middle school, and at that time, our schools integrated with uh, the west side of town, which was um, uh, a black student school. So our middle school went over to Carver uh, School, and then we came back. You know. There was a big surge of military when everybody got back from the war and families and everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they would have us like the sixth and seventh was at the Carver School, and then we had another school they called the Middle School, and then the High School. And then the Hominy ho High School that I attended is now the Hominy Community Center. Okay. So, um, there's a, a lot of alumni that have financially helped fund and try to keep that so it's been good but we now in the 19 early 70s they built a new high school here so and and they've continued to add on here north of Hominy to other complexes gymnasiums and tennis courts swimming pool and things like that so I noticed there was a strong uh, Native American presence Yes. What, were there in your, were they in your class? I mean, did you oh, go to yes. school with them? Oh yeah. We were always uh, Osage or Indian people were always in our classes. It wasn't, and I went to school with the blacks. It was before that in the early, I guess late fifties that you know all that integration started. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's that's we've had diversity in Hominy for a long time. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's. And our uh, school, uh, what is it? We're the Hominy Bucks. Okay. We have oh, we have Buck Pride here. We do not have any problems with the Native American, the Osages, uh, saying that we are, you know, uh, have negative thoughts and stuff because they we're proud of our American heritage here in Osage County and. Um, uh, They'll say just play an integral part in our in our schools, our communities, and everything. That's so, nice. so in in high school, were you part of 4-H or FFA? No, we did not have FFA. I don't. The only place that, that we in Osage County that we have FFA is in Fairfax. Hmm. We've had 4-H for years, but I don't remember it being in Harmony at that time. No, and the fam and the Drummond family didn't participate in, in it either. That's interesting. I mean, that's I know. Yeah, yeah. No, I was active, uh, you know, in the band, in Hominy, the band. When I was growing up, Tom Gray was our director. You know, we had 125 kids in the band, and uh, and athletics, sports. We've always had wonderful football and, and uh, basketball teams. Baseball has just, you know, started really coming on, but, um, well, since my children in the last 20, 25 years, you know, we're talking 50 years ago for me, but uh, we, we didn't have any, um, any, it was never in our schools, that 4-H or FFA. Well, about how many is in a class these days? You know, I think maybe 30. Okay. It's gone down. When I graduated, there was 50 in the class, 50 to 55, and uh, I, our rural schools are suffering, you know. There aren't any jobs. The jobs are limited here. They closed our grocery store this spring here. Mm -hmm. We have a dollar store now. We have to drive 10 miles to Cleveland for groceries. That's the closest. And um, 
if it wasn't for the school system and the uh, correctional system that's here, the prison, uh, those are the two large employers. Hmm. And um, I just hope that we can get a grocery store back in town because that's, that's hurting. You haven't lost your post office. That's the main, no. main thing to, no. to keep that. No, well, we've got, in fact, our post office, I believe, is a hub for a couple of the other communities around here. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, they, we, it's just uh, the, the main street has kind of died down, died back. I wondered, I mean, I, businesses are changing too. Right, yes, and sure. we have a lot of people that are, are live around Harmony rurally that work in Tulsa. Mm. Um, I have a, a Tulsa fireman that lives next door to me, and his wife works at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Tulsa. A turnpike being relatively close to right. that. Right, right. And Skytook Lake, you know, a lot of people have moved out around Skytook Lake, and so their children come to school but they don't necessarily trade in harmony, mm -hmm. you know. So it's it's changing. Rural America. But it's home. It is. It <laughs> is. And my children still consider this home, so that's good. So once you finished your degree in 80, 87 and you got into the business, then at what point did you get involved with conservation? Well... I, I remembered um, that Dick received an award at the banker's uh, dinner in Osage County. Every year they had annual awards that they gave out, and Dick was not one to stand up in front of people. He was kind of shy and a little embarrassed. We went to it. They presented him with the award. He wouldn't stay for pictures afterwards. That was about the only thing that I really knew that much about. But once, um, after his passing, and I needed to know more about the country that I had, the actual, the actual number of cattle that I could raise, considering the grasses that I had and everything, I went to the conservation district. Dick Bogart was the uh, executive director there for the state. He came with me. He generously said, this is what I do, you know. I, you know, I was like, no, I don't need for you to have to do that. This is my job. This is what I do. And we went over the entire ranch, and he devised for me how many cattle I could keep in each pasture. Cow, animal cow units is what it was. And um, while we were there, he gave me lots of ideas. About, I had some soil erosion. I had a pond dam that was needing some work done, and uh, he, he was a good guide and leader for me for that, and continued to um, check in with me, and, and at an open door policy. So with that, I got to know the people at the conservation district. Well, it ended up, I went to the conservation district one day while we were having to go through the estate of my husband, um, we'd left cattle on a, one of the hay meadows too long, and I wasn't going to be able to have any hay off of that that year. And I made some comment about that. We come to find out we had been in enough of a drought that I could get some financial help to buy hay. So that you know, stimulated me right there. I was like, I need to be finding out more things about this. Um, I got in touch with OSU Extension. I was going to lots of producer meetings in Tulsa, Veneta, Stillwater, Ponca City, you know, learning more things and everything. Um, and the thing of it is, I'd gotten, uh, I had, uh, when I finished my degree at OSU, I was in business management. And as a mother, you become a time management expert. Mm -hmm. Getting this done, getting that done, keep you know being involved with my children, and all of that. And uh, so I felt like my management skills really started kicking in at that point. Uh, and about 
uh, three years after Dick died, one of my husband's close friends, he and his wife were close to me too, uh, he was serving, Dennis Fields was serving on the Osage County Conservation Board. He called me and he said, hey girl, I want you to know I put your name up to serve on the Osage County Conservation Board. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, J. Barry Harrison is going off the board because he's going to run for state senate. And he had to resign and we we're looking for names. And Frank Keating, our governor, is needing more women to serve, and you're an active producer. And I said, Dennis, I don't know about this. He said, it's not going to involve that much of your time, you know. And um, he said, but you need to check it out. So I went to a meeting, if I remember right, to see kind of what it was and everything was welcomed. And... Um, so I agreed to go ahead and go on the board at that time. And that was in November of 1990. Okay. And I had to go before this to have a Senate approval after the governor's recommendation and went to the Capitol and, and that was all taken care of. And so I, um, I went on the board. No, that wasn't in 1990. Yeah, I guess that was. Well, you we would have been on the Osage County Board before you went on. Yes. The, before you went on the commission. Yes. So yeah. So it was in ninety in nineteen ninety, and um, I was just kind of learning the ropes. And there's so many programs and acronyms and things. You know, I was just learning and and um, seeing how the the conservation district worked. Osage County has over a million two acres. So we go, we outreach a long way, and we would have people from the Scheidler area, which is north and west of us, from the Fairfax area. Um, had a hard time finding anyone from Sky Two. Comedy was about as far uh, south as they came, but then we get somebody closer toward the Bartlesville area, which would be north, but still in Osage County, and then usually a local person. Um, so I was enjoying it, learning a lot, learning a lot about the programs. Um, I was needing some ponds, and I found out through conservation that there was some conservation, they called it CCC money, which was a part of USDA. Mm -hmm. I applied and was accepted to get a, I pl applied for a pond and they didn't have any funds available. Well, in about seven or eight months, I received a call that Someone had backed out. I was the next in line for a pawn. So I was able to get that done within, you know, the first two or three years. And so, you know, when you start, it, you know, it wasn't free, you know, but I got some cost share money to go with it. So that helped. And then I was able to spread some cattle out a little further and, and everything. And uh, I just um, felt like I was a sponge learning a lot of these things. And then in um, 1993, Bill Joe Culver was on the Osage County Conservation Board, but he was serving as the Area 3 uh, Conservation Commissioner in Oklahoma City. There's five commissioners that represent the whole state and it's active, <clears throat> excuse me, producers that are involved in conservation and you have to be a conservation board member because Bill Joe Culver had served for that for so long he felt like our district the Osage County Conservation District we weren't getting a lot of things different than other districts we were just staying on top of it and being aware and being more involved so he asked me if I would consider and I said, they're not going to want a woman on there. And he said, no, Frank Keating is looking for other people to serve. And you are, an act, you are a female. You are an active producer. You're not um, a landowner that's leasing your land out. You know, you understand more. And I was like, oh, I don't know. So anyway, that's when uh, I actually went on it. Oklahoma Conservation Commission. It was a five-year appointment, and um, I went in very green, 
and did not know what I was getting into, really. Great group of people, very welcoming. Um, still felt like at times the men were not real sure of me, and, um, and that was okay too. But it gave me opportunities that it was unbelievable, educational opportunities mm -hmm. to learn and to, I asked more questions, at, at first I didn't, and um, I finally got enough confidence that I was like, I don't understand this, when they would present things at our board meetings, at the commission meeting, at the Department of Ag, I didn't understand things, I spent time with each, several of the departments, whether it was finance, or if it was um, the mine reclamation that they were doing, or uh, a lot of the watershed areas that they were, just so many different programs, you know, and I apologized uh, many times for asking so many of the financial, because on my own ranch, I was dealing with a lot of financial things, and I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't, um, money being misspent. Mm -hmm. So I would ask and and that some of the other commissioners would just kind of shake their heads. Well, if they knew about it, I didn't. I didn't understand. And um, But I was told later that I sparked an interest in things that weren't asked. They just kind of accepted and approved things without knowing mm. exactly how things were. And uh, Mason Mungle was, I think, the, the first um, executive director when I got there for the, our exec, yeah, executive director, and uh, he said, you've got everybody on edge. But I found out that if you talk to the department heads about what they're doing, how they do it, we all like talking about what we know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I felt like I had a real good camaraderie with them for that. Uh, and then from that, I had served for about six years. Uh, OSU started an Oklahoma Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. So much of the USDA money had been spent. It seemed like the grass producers, the you know people that pasture cattle and things like that, the ranchers that the money was always going to the farmers for highly erodible land or for grass plantings or for uh, uh, waterways and things like that. But those of us that were ranchers, I didn't feel and OSU didn't feel that we were getting a lot of assistance with our pastures, with our, our land and our natural resources and how we could improve things and water quality. And stuff. So I was asked to help with a group of people that for, to form the Oklahoma uh, Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. And NRCS supported that. Um, we went to Washington, D.C. Uh, to several meetings. We met with legislators. We told them on the farm bills why we needed help. And um, you know, our, our economy in Oklahoma is not just oil and natural gas, it's agriculture. And so I did my little spiel when we would go in and, and lobby with our congressmen and staff. And when we came out of our first meeting, uh, the NRCS executive director, and I can't remember which one it was at that time, he was like, you're doing a good job. And I said, well, water is a, a big asset in Oklahoma. Our lakes, our creeks, our streams, whether you're floating in Illinois or you're out boating on the lakes, and so we've got to think about our water quality issues, you know? And uh, so I enjoyed it. I felt like hopefully I made a difference. We did start getting more um, in the farm bill. We got more uh, help. That's when Equip was first the Environmental Quality Incentive Program to help ranchers and farmers, you know, do improvements at a cost-share type basis, you know, 
but it had to be technical type stuff that what could be approved and that's why NRCS has stepped in and helped us. They've got great engineers and technical people that get out there in the field and they're hands on with you and uh, get a lot of stuff done. The one interesting thing, and, and I lobbied for conservation with the Oklahoma Conservation Commission several times. We'd go up for legislative days in the spring and, and do our spill and one thing or another. But, and then in the evenings we would have meetings and invite other people from different department heads in, um, you know, to talk to us about what things we needed to do. I, I was in a meeting one time and having dinner and several people were, you know, introducing yourselves. And when I said I was from Oklahoma, they said, oh, Oklahoma, we love Oklahoma. And I said, okay, I want to know why we love Oklahoma. I know why I love Oklahoma. And they said, do you know about the leadership that you have in Oklahoma that makes a difference for everyone nationally? You have mine reclamation. You have water quality issues going on. You are, are rehabbing your watersheds that have stopped flooding for years. Your people are so on top of things. They are at the forefront of everything. And when we pull people from Oklahoma in to help us nationally, they're willing, they come, they have great input. I was so proud. It just, it, it just really, and I came home and I told that story at, at a commission meeting that it was unbelievable the people that we had in Oklahoma who have that passion to, to carry on these programs and to really do the things that need to be done that make a difference. So. A little girl from Harmony. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you served two terms. Was the sec who would be a different governor if you did for the um, second appointment? Brad Brad Henry okay. uh, appointed me, I believe, the second time. Yes. Is there a limit on how many you can serve? No. And after ten years, I was having some autoimmune problem, health issues, and I told them that I would not be seeking to be reappointed. Ten years was. Uh, about all I felt like I could do. And there are so many good people in this area that are so involved. Uh, George Dunkard from Wagner County took over after I did. He served 10 years. Scotty Harriman is there now. Great, involved, you know, people. That's, that's the, the thing and, and willing to take the time and, and do what needs to be done. But also in this same time, I was asked to serve uh, on the Oklahoma State Farm Service Agency State Committee and met monthly or whenever was necessary. And that's when I asked them if they would uh, build an acronym because I didn't farm. Even though my tax return may say I'm a farmer, you know, I'm a beef producer. And um, I learned so much about all the programs and everything that's available out there. But um, of course, you're appointed at that point uh, by the Dem uh, by the national by the uh, president of the United States. So I, I don't know even who appointed me at this point. But then when uh, I think Bush came back in or what Republican, you know, we were relieved of our duties within a certain length of time, and they. But that was uh, I served under Terry Peach. He he called and asked me to. He was the SED at that point, state executive director. And uh, so I served with him and got to know other aspects and dairy farmers, you know. At, uh, so it was, it's been interesting to say the least. Wow. Been at the right place at the right time or? I guess or maybe like the that. timing, yeah, yeah. Being a female too, active producer, yeah, that, that um, you know, and now, uh, I know that Oklahoma Conservation Commission still has. At one time, there was three women when when I served that served as a commissioner for Oklahoma. Very active, yeah, very active. 
You were the first, though, so I guess so. You didn't burn. You didn't burn that bridge. They wanted more. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> That's right. Always good, left right. A good impression. Well, thank you. How often would you have to go down for that for the commission meetings? Once a month. Once a month. Unless, you know, uh, yeah, it was generally once a month. Well, during those ten years, do you recall anything that was the hot topic or issue at the time? Um. You know that's been twenty five years ago. I, I know. So I, I was thinking, was that during that were they doing the non point pollution? I don't know my dates either, so that may have uh, been different times too. Well, a, a lot of things came up. Uh, Blue Thumb started, where they started monitoring a lot of our streams and stuff, and then they actually educational wise, they got the school children involved and a lot of volunteers, and it's continued today in cleanup. Uh, saving the Illinois River, you know, all down by Tahlequah. When I was a commissioner, I represented six con 16 conservation districts, and that was one of my areas uh, that I did. Um, you know, we've had rehab of watersheds over in Washington County. They did the Double Creek over there. Rogers County has a lot of mine reclamation work that was done. Unbelievable work over there. And that's a strong conservation district to be able to get. When the mining was done years ago, they just left these awful areas with these deep areas where if you if you wanted to go swimming, you could swim, but you couldn't get out of them. They were hazards, and uh, they have worked for years getting all that. And I believe that they got are continuing with that program. Still, other states, and and there's still a few of those areas. Mm -hmm. I thought at one time that we could fill them up with trash, but you couldn't because of the water settlement and all of that stuff getting into other streams and pollution and stuff like that. So they really came in and, and rehabbed a lot of those. Um, you know, it, I represented a large area. A 16, I think. Okay. Did you have to go visit, or did you get to go visit each? I could have. I don't. I did not make all of them. I made part of them, but so many times that would be the same day as either our board meeting in Oklahoma City. It would be on my Osage County board meeting, or um, I, I just wasn't able to. You know. Would you get calls from there saying? Mm -hmm. You know, talk make sure this is a topic or right right bring before the board exactly I met lots of wonderful people and very involved passionate people that have tried to do everything that they could you know and need help or ideas and things like that so yeah it's it's been fun do you remember your last day your last meeting serving on the commission yeah they had a little party for me and uh, and the nice thing was it was my decision and they understood uh, you know basically why I was leaving and I had a good replacement coming in so I I wasn't concerned about that just thankful that I would had that opportunity well when you were appointed was there a process I mean once your name was put forward was there any doubt that it would be accepted or not? I uh, received a call that the governor had accepted my name and I was going to have to go before the Senate for approval and didn't really, was not politically involved so I didn't know and I believe it was Denny Garrison. I uh, met him in his office, went, Mason Mungle, the, our executive director, took me over and we met with Denny Garrison for this minute and then we went into a committee room there at the Capitol and I was presented and they accepted me and and that was it, you know. So. They didn't rake you over the coals with no, questions or No, they didn't rake anything. me over the coals. They, they had a little bio, I think, for me and uh, just a standard type, yes, you know, so. I understand Mason came here to your house. Before, he did. Early on, yes. He did. He, it was, uh, I, it was funny. He uh, was going to a meeting, I believe, in Bartlesville and he called me and said he was coming up this way and I was working cattle that morning I think he called the night before 
And I said, but you're welcome to come out to the ranch. And so I told, and I said, and I can show you the shortcut from the ranch, how to get toward Barnstall to get to Bartonsville. And I can get you there in plenty of time. He came, found it. Oh, the old country boy. This is before we had cell phones. And he found us. He was dressed. It was dark jeans and a big belt buckle and a nice shirt, you know. And we're cowboy and horseback. And, you know, I wasn't. I, I'm the soup truck person. But um, my guys were kind of impressed. And, and you know, Mason... He's, he can visit with anybody. He can make conversation with anybody. And he got to talking to Bill Joe Culver, who was working for me at that time. And we were trying to get some bulls out of a pasture, and they kept turning back on us. And so he said to Mason, now, Bill Joe's horse, he is a team roper, and a good one. And it was a beautiful, beautiful horse. Um, rigged up with silver, you know, I mean, it, it was rigged up really nice. And he looked at Mason and he said, do you ride? And Mason was like, well, yeah. And he said, okay. He said, you can get on the horse, stay here with the guys. We'll be right back. Well, I didn't know what was going on. I hope nobody is offended by this, but we went back to his house. He got his gun and some bird shot. And I said, are you going to shoot the bull? I mean, I, this is the first time I had seen it. He said, no, but I'm going to pop his, you know what, enough that he's going to do what we want him to do. So he let Mason ride the horse with, I think maybe there was at least three other guys. And he got out in, in the pasture, walked down along the fence line, and he started shooting it. And that bull beat everybody out of the gate, you know. <laughs> but for Mason... He was so excited. He said, not only you know, did I have fun, he said, I got to ride that horse. And uh, every time I'd see, I've seen Mason in the last few years, he would ask him, he says, where's Bill Joe? And, uh, you know, and everything. He just said, I just never will forget, you know, being able to have that opportunity. I said, you mean your meeting in Bartlesville wasn't any good that day? Or and he said, it nothing compared to that. So, yeah, we, we had a good time. And everybody was welcome, you know, at any time. So, at one time, the commissioners, we used to go to each commission area during the year for our meeting. And sometimes we'd spend the night, and then we'd, you know, have dinner and one thing together. And the commissioners, we had a good bond, and they would, you know, bring some of the uh, employees up, and, and we'd have our meetings. And we had a meeting up here in the Osage, and... Uh, state, you know, came here to the house for dinner and stuff. So it, it was, we had a good group of people, let's put it that way. But I don't think anymore that they're able to get out of the office that much because they're running, the staff's running pretty short. Yes, numbers have, yes. Yes, finished. numbers have dwindled due to budget. Mm -hmm. But that's, they're still getting a lot done though. They've still got their, their projects in the right order, I think. Well, what was some of the main things in Osage County that was being done at that? Well, um, as we've always had the Arkansas, you know, we have the Arkansas Water. River That's on the I west. Crossed? Yes, okay. that you came in. At, you got, and it extends all the way up toward Ponca, toward, toward Kay County. It, it comes around in that way. So we have a lot of farm ground down in there. And then we have uh, the sand hills at west of Pahuska, uh, where it's still open, beautiful country, you know, and then the Nature Conservancy is part of that. Down over here towards Sky Tube, which is the lake is area where you've had lots of funny flooding. We have cross timbers, Sky Tube Lake, Keystone Lake. Um, we have problems with Cerisa Lespedeza. We have problems with cedar trees. Um, you know, we have the same, it's just that we have a million two acres here, so we have all different kinds of areas. There's a lot of pecan growers over around the Sky Tooth area, have mm -hmm. been there for years. And uh, I, on our board, uh, one of our uh, directors 
is a, a pecan grower. He raises, has cattle. He's a retired Tulsa fireman. You know, so, you, you know, they, they're interested in improving and doing the best that they can with what we have and for our areas. We try to always cover, because Osage County is such a big county, each of our areas so that our, our area, like with me, other ranchers would ask me about programs when I'd see them or ask me about, you know, is there anything going on with conservation right now that we can get some help or something like that or, or you know, who's the uh, 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 district manager now, you know, things like that. So I've received, you know, phone calls at times, you know, is there any programs? But then when we have to have programs talking about the farm bill or whatever, we don't have one meeting in the county. We have at least three to five because our county is so large. I think it's the biggest one in the state, isn't it? It is. Isn't it, it is. I think Osage County is as big as the state of Rhode Island or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, we've had directors from the Granola area drive in, and it would take them an hour to get there to the meeting. Hmm. That's dedication, you know, to get things like that done. So um, I'm sure uh, right now we've started having hog problems along the Arkansas River. A wild hog. And the, um, the drought that we had four years ago, I have hogs that came up creeks. I have hogs on me now that I never had before. Wild hogs, not, they're, you know, they're feral. They're not uh, domesticated, you know, that had just gotten out. Um, so, you know, we still have coyote problems some. Our quail are starting to come back. I don't allow quail hunting. I have started, for 15 years we never had turkey out at, on our ranch. And I have turkey now, and it's very limited honey because I want them to stay. Mm. So, and all of that plays into conservation. It does. I, it I does. don't think about birds, but I guess it, you know, hunting does. Right. Right. Habitat. Exactly. Habitat. Exactly. So is there a solution for the hogs? <laughs> Oh, eradications, I know. Well, it's tricky, yeah. Tricky topic. Uh, each one of our conservation districts this last year was given a hog trap door that we can rent out. In Osage County, we purchased the panels and the fence posts and everything to where when, they, when a producer would come in and rent it for a month at a time, there is a fee attached to that. Um, they can set it up, you know, in order to try to, and then have some guidelines and kind of tell them instructions on how most of the people know where the hogs are and how to set them up and everything. We haven't purchased one of those that you monitor from your phone and you drop the gate when they drop in there, you know. But um, there are the state, the Oklahoma State Department of Ag sends planes up every now and then for hogs and for um, coyotes. Wow. And They've been up three times that I know of this last year. I have a volunteer fella out of Tulsa that, as a sport, he owns a Black Hawk helicopter and comes on his own with sharpshooters and they get hogs. And they have concentrated along, a lot along the Arkansas River this last year. But they also, during the winter months, got 44 hogs behind one of my facilities. So that's, it's, it's 44. becoming 44, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, they're not good because they will get into the quail eggs and, you know, the turkeys and they'll, they'll kind of run them off. And the deer, it causes the, the hogs cause the deer movement to be different than it should be. Hmm. Well, they do, do they do damage to the ground? They do. They, they're digging it up and making messes and, you know, if you get a hard rain, they'll sometimes pack it down, but they're just, they'll, they'll carry ticks. Yeah, and I'm wondering about what other de diseases. I, uh, I have a young man here in town that I said I would never use hog dogs, and I now have a fellow that comes in with hog dogs, 
and you know there's usually two or four guys that go with them and uh, they take care of them they do not catch them and sell them or haul them anywhere else they kill them on the spot mm. so it's they're not they're not good what well, do they interact with the cattle any or not really but they sure know when we go and feed cattle in the winter months yeah they'll they'll that be hiding sense. i uh went into one pasture this last winter and i had a bale of hay out away from the uh feed troughs when i went in the cattle weren't waiting on me so i have a siren on my truck so i drove a little bit further south and went by this bale of hay that I had rolled out, and on the end of it, there was still a little bit of a round mound of, of hay, you know, there. All of a sudden, this sow comes out, and about 13 little pigs take out and are running after her, and they're squealing and all kinds of stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh. And it was, you know, 100 yards from uh, the feed troughs that were in the pasture. And I was like, yeah, they're over here because they're going to pick up anything, they'll scour around the feed troughs and stuff, and they do damage, you know, there's no doubt about it. They'll make a, a wet waller out of some place and then it can start erosion and stuff. Mm. We pretty well had them run off from us, but as of three days ago, we have now two sows, a boar, and I don't know how many little pigs, and they're coming back in up the creek. Oh. The fences won't stop that. They'll just go no. under. Right, right, right. And they multiply monthly. Well, it's you part know, two to the batch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So oh, wow. we don't want them. We're going to have to stay on top of them. I, I don't know. Never a dull day, it sounds like. No, there, it's a yeah, new, day, new day every day. Don't do the same thing every day, usually. What about how many cattle do you um, about 300 cows, but then I'm running stalkers too, which come in, I, you know, start buying them, you know, December, January, depending on the market, and then we'll run them through June, July, and grass. That's the only thing I have to sell is grass, you know, so, um, and they're, they're doing well now. I've definitely seen the highs in the last few years, and would love to have a few more of those, but hopefully, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm more, more than maintaining right now, let's put that. But you know, I went through a, a series, of, they call them IRN, uh, Integrated Resource Management, and I had already been doing it and I didn't have a name for it, and Integrated Resource Management is that you get your team together, your banker, your conservation people, your environmental people, your vet, and and you kind of just devise a plan so, so that when you have questions or problems or you need some answers, you have your people set up to really help. And, and I needed that probably more than anything of how to do, even my, uh, livestock buyer you know i mean there are sale barns around not as many as there used to be but um when i buy my cattle i i have that person that helps me and because uh, you know and then four children you know and nine grandchildren i'm kind of short on time sometimes with a few things do you buy them online no, I know there's some auctions. Yeah, I have. I don't. Online. I haven't done any any superior cattle online. I've seen them at times, but no, I I haven't done that. But I know people that have. And you don't ride a horse. You ride a truck. All right, correct. <laughs> or or a four wheeler, a gator, you know, or something like that. Yeah. But you can ride a horse. You just choose not to. Or yeah, I'm definitely not now. Not now at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, going forward, do you see how much longer do you think you'll? I don't know. Any idea? I don't know. I I think about that more every day, as as I get older. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I I, I have done so many of the projects. I'm a project person. I've done so many of the projects at the ranch. I was able to get into Equip, which is Environmental Quality Incentive Program 
where they come out and evaluate and I had a certain area that I was wanting to do some uh, tree, the blackjacks uh, uh, removal. And so I did some spiking. I got approved to do spiking and spray for Cerisa Lespedeza and build a couple of ponds. I was able to get that done and then I moved to another area and never could qualify after that because other people, you know, would, were getting involved. Uh, my children and I participated in several uh, cost share, Oklahoma State cost share programs that we get through the commission. Mm -hmm. It's given and it's to help eradicate either whatever our conservation district teams as, well, we have priorities. Every year we state our priority problems in our area, whether it's erosion, or for grass plantings, or for um, uh, uh, tree eradication, cedar eradication. At one time, our office had a cedar tree eradication program that was in the southern part of the county. And it wasn't for $100,000, but we were able to fulfill that, help some people get rid of some problems, and utilize that money in the county. Mm -hmm. And that's why Osage County is, has always stayed active to get people to know about the programs so that we can keep putting money back into the county and improve our land and our resources. Well, how do you get the word out? How do you get them to know about it? Um, a lot of it's word of mouth. We advertise a lot in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have meetings. We work with the Cattlemen's Association, um, OSU Extension. They'll have meetings. We'll be a part of it with, with uh, conservation. But we've always worked hand in hand. Our people have always worked together. Uh, every year, or for when we'll be talking about the farm bill in the different areas of the county, mm -hmm. we'll bring in conservation. Here's some programs that we feel like you would be interested in. You know, we have information here, please come by the office. Our office is busy, very busy. I wonder, where, where, where is it? Is it in? It's, it's located in Pahaska. Pahaska, okay. And the nice thing is that it, it, within that building, we have the Farm Service Agency. We have uh, Triangle Serum, which is a vet supply company. So a lot of times, people will go to the vet to pick up vaccine or check on things and then they'll come around the corner to see right. us or we're the draw for them to go to the vet place too so it's been a real win-win situation with that um, our people are very knowledgeable and uh, in fact our, our district secretary I think had been with us 26 years. So she knew a lot of people. Knew, and if yes. there's something that needed to be done, we don't think anything about picking the phone up and making a phone call and saying, we need for you to come in and you know sign up. Or did you get our, our letter? Well, you need to come in because it's gonna, that program's gonna close on the 15th and we need to have your John Henry. And uh, so there, there's a lot of that that's, you know, does the district have its own building? I know some, some do. No, we don't. We yeah. don't. We rent it at, actually from Triangle Searing, us and, and FSA. Um, we've considered it at times, but not been able to get it off the ground. What's your source of income? For the well, county? the conservation district in our, the natural resource conservation district is in our office. And so we share a lot of things. The Oklahoma Conservation District funds us two employees. Um, when our other employee, our district secretary, retired after 26 years, we were on a temporary basis because of the state budget. And uh, but we've been able to uh, NRCS is helping us a little bit because they're actually our district secretary is doing a lot of procedures in the office uh, for NRCS, lots of computer type stuff. She's being trained to do other things now. And I think this is the way it's just, it's gonna have to go. 
our, we have a district secretary and then we have a district manager and he does a lot of things in the field. We have a sunflower drill. We do grass plantings for Bermuda. We sell Bermuda roots. We sell chemicals that producers can come in and pick up for sprays and and do and uh, and then with NRCS, we've been without our uh, executive director for Osage County, but we have a new uh, lady coming uh, in June. But finally, we've been without for about, I don't know, 16 months or something. People will move around and stuff. And um, so she's going to be there. But we've had other districts come in once or twice a week for a 90-day period. They were our temporaries. Okay. But a lot of the programs overlap. But we have a... a technician, an NRCS engineer technician that's been with us for many, many years. And he knows most of those programs and he, he can get a lot of the things done, but he can't sign off on some things. So him and the district manager go out in the fields, they make the observations, they do the technical stuff, and they come back and start all the paperwork. Mm. It's been busy. But we're making a go. And as of right now, we have a soil conservationist in the office, Young, who is doing a lot of training. She's there, but she's, you know, learning a lot and out of the office a lot. And, uh, and she will continue to move up within the NRCS agency. And then we have a student intern for the summer, probably for eight weeks. I just met her the other day. She's from Tishomingo, and she knows, you know, so much of that, Information now is on the computer, and they're updating all the time. So and two females. Actually, we have four females in our office. When once July one gets here, and two males. Wow! But they're temporary, and um, so it's it's interesting. If you want to know, you just want someone to tell you. Doesn't that necessarily mean gender? Doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have a little cash flow by selling these seeds and yes, renting out the drills do, and stuff. So. Yes, we do. And we, we uh, years ago, we started with the, doing the plat books of the maps. And those have become quite a thing where the courthouse figured out. So they started selling them too because our district manager went out and sold all the ads so that we could fund it to get it done and everything. But it's, it's still a, a good money thing. We're selling maps of the county that we buy from the map. You know, we don't make a fortune off of them, but we're now laminating the maps and our district manager is framing. A lot of people come in and they wanted to be able to, you know, put in their office or whatever. So we started doing that, a lot of the chemical, but they have the expertise in telling you how much per gallon or per sprayer or you know, all of that stuff, that, and we sell seeds. He gets a lot of seed from Enid to be able to, and to have on hand, or if he doesn't have enough, he can go and get it. So it's all those conservation things. Um, a lot of the conservation stewardship people have been renewed. They're a five-year contract that's approved through the USDA, and everything's changing and every year there has to be an annual report you have to come in show what you've been doing you know and, and bring all your paperwork in well we got these uh things called ramp rat ramp rat 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 ramps that's what they are and that's for livestock waters and things if an animal should get into your stock tank or automatic water or stuff, they now have this rat ramp that you clamp on there to where it can walk and get out and not stay in there and drown, you know. Mm -hmm. So our conservation district, we started selling those, you know, to have on hand and stuff like that. But our sunflower drill, we've been able to make money and, and keep it going. Um, there's just other things. but. We help during the cavalcade. We, our tractor, they use our tractor and some of our equipment, you know, as a, a good gesture. 
we get credit in the book or the program that the Osage County Conservation did or the district did this or whatever. So, um, but we've got good people that stay on top of it and work with other people, you know, as well as as our directors. And you've so. been on the board almost thirty years, or at least thirty, at least thirty About years. Twenty-seven, maybe. We're working yeah. on thirty then. Yeah. And I understand Fred Drummond was on it for roughly 30 years, too. Right, right. Uncle Fred A. Yeah, one of the first ones. He was, uh, yeah. Uh, Was he still alive when you went on? um, He wasn't on the board, but yes, he he was was alive. He was a very big uh, encourager. They were talking about Fred's reaction to you getting on the board. Oh, he was always an encourager. He helped Dick and I. Um, the last few years of Dick's life with a lot of different things and uh, he, uh, he he was positive for agriculture and he encouraged me a lot. He helped me a lot with the livestock after Dick died and advised me and, and uh, was willing, you know, was a willing participant uh, in the Drummond family. So, yeah, and he was, he was glad that I would... Uh, was continuing on. He was one of the, I think, one of the founding uh, directors on the Osage County Board, so he believed in it. He's one of the ones that uh, felt like with conservation uh, to burn your grass in the spring, which we now call prescribed burns, and um, how high the protein and OSU came up and did a lot of research and things like that too mm-hmm. to help it and uh, to this day we I don't burn every year we burn every three years down here but it sure helps eradicate a lot of cedars and, and uh, a lot of debris that maybe has fallen on the ground and stuff but the protein in the grass is really really high and cattle the calves do really well and how is he related to you? Who was your... Uh, he would be my husband's uncle. Uncle, okay. Uh-huh. My husband had... Uh, his dad was a twin, and Fred A. was the older of the uh, boys. I noticed they have his house downtown. Well, no, is that, that is actually is that one? the grandfather. That would be Fred A.'s grandfather, yes. Okay. How? Yeah. Because it was built in 1907. So Drummonds have been in the area. For they have. For they a long have. Time, and time. Mr. Drummond uh, was uh, from Scotland, mm. and Mrs. Drummond was a full blood German. Mm. Wow. So, yes. So, yeah. Well, what does it take to be a good board member if, if you're looking for someone to join? What, what are you looking for? Uh, well, I think someone that uh, has the time and will take the time, you know. No one has the time, but we make time to do and uh, to be a part of a process. We've got several guys on the board right now that I didn't think would uh, stay on for very long, but they're learning. They're learning and uh, they're like sponges, you know. Uh, our board members do change and uh, and, and but that's okay. We need new blood, and uh, it, it's just interesting because they have taught programs just like I have with people to get them involved in stuff, um, and they can see that progress has been made. You know, I think more than anything. But um, someone that's really wants to be actively involved, and everybody. Uh, very few people that we have on our board now, they have other jobs, Mm -hmm. you know, they have, they're in their profession and uh, uh, so uh, we can't always make all the meetings that need to, you know, that are put out there, but uh, when they do, they learn a lot. It's not a paid, it's a volunteer, right? It's a total volunteer. We used to get like a little bit of mileage we used to get like fifteen dollars or twenty five dollars a meeting, and that was all taken away with our budget cuts. So, well, is there a process? I mean, do, do people vote on who gets to be on the board, or is it how, how does that work? I believe there's 
two appointed, the board appoints two people, and then three are elected. And every two years, I think it's, I could be wrong, um, the appointed, I think, are for two years, and the elected are for three years. And we put notices in the paper when there is a position that's open, and the person that has it at this point, we, we just went through this, one of the, the guys um, wanted to continue serving on the board, so he signed all the paperwork, but we still had to put it in the paper that we had a position open, and if you would like to apply, and uh, every now and then we will have someone, but not not real often. Um, now the appointed ones is just an automatic appointed. When I went, I was actually in an elected position, but when I went on the Oklahoma Conservation Commission, they put me into an appointed position because if I had been in the elected position, I could have, if someone had filed against me and won, I couldn't have served on the, on the Oklahoma Conservation Commission. Okay. Yeah, that makes so, sense. You know, it's it's a paperwork thing, I think, more than anything. Well, if it's elected, who's doing the voting? Um, County if residents? no one runs they're, they're against the person that's in there, or if only one person signs up, there won't be a vote. They're received by acclamation. Okay. Otherwise, everyone in the county that's a conservation district producer that's on the rolls. You have to be a, 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 you have to have a conservation plan is eligible to vote. Okay. And we haven't had, we thought we were going to have one this spring and the guy that signed up did not totally understand what he was signing up for. So I think he's going to go on as an associate director to be able to, because he's still working full time, uh, and make meetings when he can to kind of see if this is something like he would like to do because eventually we're going to have a couple of people that are, you know, probably going to say, okay, I've done my 15 years and I think that's enough and I think I'll move on, so, and including me, you know. So are there meetings about, about once a month? Yes, typically? we do meet once a month unless it, every now and then um, we don't have enough folks that can make it uh, so we don't have a quorum because one of our directors is with the Osage County Fire, um, the Osage Nation Fire Department and this spring when we were having all those fires he could not make the meeting and then another young man from over around Skytook is a uh, Tulsa Fire Department he's on the, at the Tulsa Fire Department and they were having a lot of grass fires and, um, you know, so every now and then we don't have a quorum, but generally, at least we have at least 10 meetings a year. Oh. And it's on a set time. A couple hours each or... Right, so. right, right. Hmm. It's still a little bit of, it's a commitment that you need to, it, it comes with love, I guess, is what those who do it. Yeah, I think um, a passion for doing passion. it and being involved, and you gotta really like, you know, what you're doing and feel like you're making a difference, you know, and that you can make a difference. So you have a conservation plan yourself for your for yes. your ranch. Yes, and I uh, a conservation plan is not the same year after year, but I haven't updated it. Any time that I am in a I sign up and get approved for a program. We have to we have to go in and redo the conservation plan because things have changed. Mm -hmm. And um, and if I would lose a lease or you know one of my girls would sell or something, you have to keep your your plan current. And that might involve ponds and waterways and right well it's not so much that it's more the legal aspect of it now if I go in and, and actually would do if I would get back into uh, well I'm in conservation stewardship the CSP program right now and 
if I do a pond repair or something like that, I don't have to do that. But I've signed up to do certain things every year. And when I go in for my review, I have to sign off that I've done those things. So accountability, I think, probably is uh, more than anything. But, you know, the, the technician in the office, I wanted to do some spiking, which was eradicate a bunch of trees in some really rolling canyony type areas. And very quickly he informed me, you'll never get in any kind of program because of the terrain of the land. And if we would eliminate a lot of those trees, you're gonna have erosion and then you'll expect us to come in and help you take care of that. And we cannot get into the construction business, you know, and things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of advice out there if you just take it. <laughs> so, you, yeah, but, but you also have to be familiar with every spot on your property. Exactly. If you've got 5,000 acres or whatever, that's... Right, right. But I, we don't, I, you know, we don't own it all. So, right. That a lot of it's leased. Well, I'll show my ignorance. You mentioned a, a term, eradicate something. It must be a weed or something. Cerisa Lespedes. I've never heard of it. What is that? Well, my understanding is that Cerisa Lespedes was brought in here like in the 50s by the USDA, and it was supposed to be wonderful, and that quail would eat it. It is one of those obnoxious weeds that takes over and will just literally, it'll kill out grass and everything else. And it grows very, very fast. The seeds are like little hard balls. And um, they can sit there, from what I've read, 20 to 30 years. But when you have a fire, it pops them open and it just comes right back. Hmm. Two weeks ago, I had Cerisa coming up in pastures that was that tall, and it's already that tall right now. And I met with the aerial spray guy this morning, and we're going to hit a few places, but I can't do the whole ranch. The cattle, it's not good for cattle to cattle eat. Cattle won't eat it. It's got a, a bitter taste, and quail don't like it. I'm not sure if goats would even eat it. Hmm. And I eat everything from what I yeah. understand. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But you didn't have to do special fencing. Is it that that you see that's got the purple blooms, or is that something else? It's kind of white, like a vine. Uh, that's vine? that's um that's a form of uh, that's another lespedes, I believe. But that's not bad stuff. It's this stuff. It'll grow tall, and then in the fall it'll have white flowers on it. And I have had a guy with a ground rig come in and spray, and and we would talk every day. And he said, okay, how much? You know, and I'd say, he said, have you got any white flowers yet? And I said, they're starting to come out. He said, okay, within two days, I've got to get there and get it done. And he did. And I mean, it cleaned up areas that an aerial, well, the aerial spray guys weren't even around. But we had to use a different chemical. You couldn't use Remedy. You had to use a fall. It was for fall instead of spring, summer. Um, I'm trying to say toward on, but I don't think that's not it. I can't remember what it is. That's a whole nother, another set of vocabulary. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Another whole set of chemicals. That's crazy. You have to know a little bit of everything. Sounds you learn. Like, yeah. Let's put it that way. You yeah. learn, yeah. Well, if you don't know something, where do you go to get your information? Uh, depend on what it is. I, it's like I have two pond dams right now that are needing some repair work done. And looking at them, I'm not sure a dozer can get in there. So I called my dozer operator that also has, um, not backhoe, he has backhoes, but he also has, oh, don't, don't do that to me. <laughs> Uh, Special equipment. We'll yeah, call it, we'll call uh, it that. the big uh, track hole. It's a track hole to where he can sit on the pond dam and he can go and dig and pull rock up and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, I just, I ask, 
I asked a lot of questions. Sometimes I feel like I ask too many questions, but the one question that you don't ask, you know, and, and I used to feel bad because I would ask so many questions at the commission meeting. And they're like, no, don't, you know, don't feel that. And they never made me feel bad about asking questions and, and finding out the answers and stuff. So um, I just search and try to figure out how to do or what to do, all of that. So. If find the right person that connects you with the next person. Exactly, okay, exactly. And if they don't know, the conservation district, we were wanting to have a lot of our county maps laminated. And I checked at Kinko's and I checked at FedEx, Kinko's FedEx, and I checked at Staples, no, Office Depot. And they didn't, they could only go up to 24 inches. So I contacted, I have some hunting leases with groups and I, one of the guys works for a big company in Tulsa that does things like so I contacted him by email and said do you have anyone that you know he said let me tell you this is who we use all the time you know and uh, and then in between time we found out that Staples and Ponca City could do them and so you know you just start asking questions and people people are pretty good about giving you information you know then you do with what you want. You know, you don't always, uh, people are, there were times when I would ask people questions and they were like not willing to, um, or not comfortable sharing, you know, sometimes information. I ran into that and it's okay. You know, I just went a different direction. Well, have you had to go and talk people into doing easements for watershed? Waterway sheds. No, and stuff for we the haven't had we the seven watersheds that has all been taken care of now. We have had problems with someone below buying the land and wanting that watershed opened up or something, or us having to go in and do repair work, and they didn't want us in even though we had a legal easement. So we've had to get a hold of the commission and they've had to write the letters, get their attorneys involved and all of that, but it's it's worked out, you know. So it's not really all on the district level's responsibility to do that, the commission helps. Right, right. And our watersheds, we do inspections annually. And if we have a huge rain, our district managers out there checking to see if there was any damage because we've had storms to where debris would, would get caught in some of the uh, equipment and, and keep the valves from working properly and, and all of that. And uh, so our district manager, you know, he takes care of things like that. But uh, um, any structures on the property that you manage? No. So I, you don't have to? No, they're all up by uh, north and, and east of. Uh, Pahaska up at uh, around the Hewlett Dam mm -hmm. Lake and uh, everything up there, but we do maintain them. Uh, we get funds every year. We weed spray, and if there's any trees, we eliminate them. You know, if there's a problem with one of the watersheds, we'll get dozers in there or equipment people to get it taken care of, and we fertilize in order to maintain the grass, you know, and stuff. Uh, in order to get into one of them, it's up at the old, the Mollendor Ranch. We, part of our contract with the Conservation Commission was we get gravel to come in and, and so that we can get to the watershed. We help them gravel a couple, a road that goes up there to it so we can get to it. Um, and we've been able to maintain it and, and eliminate a lot of problems, you know, is if you maintain it all the time, it helps. Uh, so you, you gotta know about your ranch plus this other stuff if you're involved, so. Right. I wanna switch gears just a minute and talk about the entrance to your house. Yes. With the symbol on it. Uh -huh. It's the reverse, it, a backwards one, isn't it? Okay, if you look, one goes one way, the other goes the other way. Okay. It's peace and good luck, 
There are Native American signs, that, and from what I've researched, it's Ethiopian Indians used that many, many years ago, like the 13-1400s, and the Native Americans have used it, you know, it's like the hand is for friendship, but this is one way is peace, the other way is good luck. And, and then the arrowheads, this home was built by a full-blood Osage Indian, and he brought some of the <clears throat> Indian symbols in. So about <coughs> how, when was the house built, do you know? Mm -hmm. It was started. I noticed it said Carson, <coughs> yes. Carson down the sides. But I'm in the wrong place. But no, she said it was buff brick, so I'm good. Right, <laughs> right. Tom Carson was the original Osage, full blood Osage Indian. And his parents were both uh, full a lot ease when they divided up the mineral rights and stuff. So he was quite wealthy. Um, and he had one brother, but Philip died as a young man, so he even inherited his. And then Tom Carson did not have any children. He was married, but he didn't have any children. But all of this is the original. The house was built in 1929, finished in 1930, and right in the awful depression. Mm -hmm. um, the house is, is a it's not a traditional um, house as far as it's not a Tudor. It's not a, um, it's got all of the windows have uh, concrete underneath the windows. It's built very, very sturdy. I have a partial basement. It does leak a little. It's not bad, but you can't really store anything on the ground, you know. And uh, it, uh, but this is the original house. When we bought it in 1973, they hadn't really lived in the house. Birds had lived in the house. They came in through the fireplace. And uh, it was too expensive for them to uh, live here. Out back there were summer houses and they lived in them. Chicken house, uh, grape arbor going out there. Then there was a there was never a washer a washing machine in this house, hmm. and it was um, they had a, a wash house with a uh, well um, that went through it and the drainage and all that. They had a barbecue pit out back. There's a stone building out back where they would slaughter the hogs or whatever, and then they would smoke them on the other side with the barbecue pit that would smoke it up into, and it's all caved in and everything now, but they kind of did their own little facility out here. It's pretty. I love the fireplace. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it is it is the original. The hardwood floors are the original. There was a boiler in the basement that you couldn't even get parts for when we bought it. That would have to have been handmade, and it probably was not very efficient. So we've had to redo a lot. Well, in the basement, at least you go if there's a tornado coming. Exactly. Exactly. When my neighbors put in a, a storm cellar, I was like, "Why did they do that when they could come here?" But I don't have time. Yeah, do their own thing. <laughs> well, they probably meant to use it as a for their can canned goods. Oh, when we moved in here, this house was a hoarder's house. Um, the guy that I bought it from, he had married the widow of Tom Carson, and um, there was newspaper stacked from the floor to the ceiling. There was furniture everywhere. I mean, just constant everywhere. Too much stuff in the house. In the basement, there I have still have some crocks that rice and beans were stored in. I had um, jugs, fruit jars, full of canned fruit. And three boys made the mistake of coming out here. They were teenagers, could ride their motorcycles out, and they helped me pull everything out of the basement. And at the time, there was an old dugout pond in front of the house, and I had them go out and pour all that stuff out rather than just throw the jars out. And uh, within the last year, I've started cleaning stuff out. I'm taking things to a consignment store 
And it, they're selling the, the turquoise jars with the glass lids with the wire mm -hmm. and, and stuff. Um, the lady had been through the depression and said she would never go through a depression again. Mm -hmm. There was sheets still in plastic wrap that had probably been bought in the 50s. And it was awful. Magazines stacked up. Um, crazy stuff. Yeah. Kind of fun to go through it now, I guess. Well, it's I went through it. We finally reached the point. I've got a frame thing. We had an auction. In the summer house out back, there was dining room tables and huge, huge pieces of furniture. And when, and it was just driving me nuts. And you, you know, you just couldn't go out there and look at it. And old metal step stools and dishes in the cabinets. And when there was an old wind up oak telephone. And my husband loved that phone. And he loved showing it to people. One day it disappeared. Mm. Somebody had real sticky fingers and had, Anyway, they took it, and it made him so mad. He said, I'm, I'm ready to have an auction and get rid of this stuff. So we did. And in our kitchen was a porcelain-footed uh, stove with six burners, a warmer, and four ovens. One was a warmer oven. It was porcelain white with green trim, but it was that light green. And, um, and then the ovens. And one little lady that used to cook at the hospital came out here one day and she said, girl, when you get to Cannon, you're going to love that stove. <laughs> well, we could not get it to regulate. It had not really been used. But it, it wouldn't, it, I didn't, you couldn't get a regulator for it. Put a cake in and it'd burn it every time, raw in the middle and it'd be black, you know. Well, at the time, then the Drummond home here in town, the, the uh, historical home now, they were needing a stove. The stove that was in there was gone. Uncle Will had taken it out. They didn't know what he'd done with it. And he'd put a little old gas stove in there. Well, they didn't want that. <clears throat> so we had that stove. And the curator said, yes, I'd love to have that stove. And, I, and Dick said, okay. I'm going to run it through the auction when we have this big auction. And Shirley said, please don't do that. And Shirley Pettengill was the curator there for years. And uh, he said, no, I'll PO it. I'll pull it out. But I want a tax deduction for it, hmm. which was really smart. Well, we had a live bidder to $1,800 on that stove, and we still PO'd it. And we, I knew the guy that did it, and I think he was buying it to resell it or something, you know. And when Dick's grandfather, Papa, who was R.C., son, you're crazy. You should have sold the damn thing. And Dick said, well, Pa, I wanted it to go in your mother's house. And, oh, well, okay. <laughs> so it's in there, you know, and that's where it needs to be. It is. I would agree. It's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous stove, so... Anyway, but it's this has been a nice home for my children, you know, but a lot of history. Yeah, it, there is. There family is. history, family history. Exactly. All of it, yeah. Exactly. But I did have the barn and the house next door and I just reached a point I didn't need another house to maintain, you know, and so these young kids came and I made them a deal and so they've been good neighbors ever since. Cool. Do you see yourself staying here? No. 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 It's 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 gonna to be too much house. Too it's, much. Yeah. Yeah. It's good for when the kids come home and the kids will be in and out here before long, but no. I I don't see myself staying here. It's just too much house. Yes. I can see that too. Well we've covered a lot. Is there anything else we need to do before um, I ask before I ask my last question? I don't think so. We've talked about anything on my list, just let me look real quick. Grazing land we've discussed. Oh, no, we've got that too. So my last question is, since we're talking about history, how do you want to be remembered? 
Oh gosh. Um, hopefully that I made a little bit of difference in this wonderful world we have. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say there's no doubt there. Well, I, I, it's it's been enjoyable. I've enjoyed working with conservation and uh, definitely feel like. At, the, at my girls, my daughter's ranch and I, I, I can see a difference that, you know, we definitely improved and, uh, but not um, environmentally, it's, it's better, it's more productive. Some people may think I've done too much, you know, but, because um, we had a lot of trees, but now it's just maintaining and I just hope that I can, uh, uh, increase the production on it with cattle, you know, because I just, I think that's, uh, it's been a wonderful way of life, too. You've been a good steward of the land. A good steward of the land, exactly. That's... Well, before we close off, do you want to name your daughters, or do you... Oh, well, so my it's... eldest daughter is Lynn. Uh, all, I'm proud to say all four of my daughters are college graduates, so... That was uh, kind of tough, and they didn't have any student loans when they left college. So. And some from OSU. Well, three are from OSU. The, my nurse didn't graduate from OSU, oh, that's but okay. that's good. She's she's an RN and very a very good one, but she lives in Virginia. So Lynn is um, was a marketing graduate from Oklahoma State University, and um, is married to Brigadier General Brad Swanson there right now located uh, for the next two years in Tampa, Florida. They have three children. Uh, and one, Hannah, the oldest, just graduated with a master's from the University of Virginia. And she did get that is in an entrepreneur business degree. And she's traveling right now with, with the university overseas. And then her daughter, is, the second daughter is Claire, and she plays lacrosse at the University of Tampa. Um, and is a good student, is now in ROTC and is taking private pilot lessons this summer and uh, is hoping to fly jets at some point. And uh, then Will is um, will be 16 this summer and he will be in, the, I think, the ninth grade this next year. He might be a sophomore and uh, we're hoping he'll come to OSU. Okay. Because uh, Lynn's husband, Brad, is an OSU grad also. He's from Cushing, Oklahoma. Yeah. Now, my second daughter is Janet Drummond. She has three sons. Thomas is an OSU grad with an MIS degree, now working in uh, Midland, Texas. And he is a heck of a good bass guitarist and plays with bands quite often and played in Austin last weekend. So he's enjoying life for, for sure and did well at OSU. And then George is uh, uh, will be a senior in high school this next year. And then his younger brother, Henry, uh, will be a sophomore this next year. Mm -hmm. So they're growing up on me. And then my third daughter, Julie, is living in Richmond, Virginia. She is an Aryan and has one son, Nathan, that's 10 years old. And they're planning to come and visit me here pretty soon, pretty soon. And uh, her husband is also an Aryan. And then Laura is married to a OSU grad. He's from Blackwell, Oklahoma, Chad Irig. And he's a University of Oklahoma, uh, uh, got his law degree there. And they've lived in Austin for five years now. Um, and uh, they have Ainsley, who is a very excitable, full of life child all the time. And she will be in the sixth grade I could be wrong, it may be seven. And then younger sister Paige, and she will be in the fourth grade this wow. next year. So they're busy and very busy, very busy kids. Good mamas, I have to say. Well, they had a good role model. Well, yeah. They, I think yeah. in two L's and two J's, right? Yes, yes. But, <laughs> the, yeah, Lynn um, is Dana Lynette, so that's confusing but she has to sign as Dana L so mm. anyway that we you know we stay in touch very often you know a lot and they still basically love the ranch but they're not really here and a part of it because 
life is taking them elsewhere. Taking them elsewhere. Yeah, but they come back and they're concerned. So that's that's good. It's good. Mm -hmm. Had a good life. Yeah, it has. It has. That's well, a good way to end. So thank you for letting me come today. Well, yes, thank you. It's been great. Thank you.